Hello. How'd you do that? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. I know, but. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Matthew Arouk. I'm the director of the Global Education uh, Program at EarthDay.org. Welcome, everyone, to the Climate Education Hub here at COP27. Uh, we're very happy to welcome you all into our pavilion and our space. Uh, as I've said before, our goal, or one of our goals here at COP27 is to really center and elevate the role of education and education-related issues within the climate sector. So we're really happy that everyone is able to come out. Uh, and for those of you who are joining virtually or remotely, thank you again. Uh, our mission at EarthDay.org is to diversify, educate, and activate the world's largest environmental movement. So education is critical to our mission here. And as part of the, the global education program, we do a number of different things. So uh, the way this kind of panel or this event is going to operate is it's really an opportunity to give the public a chance to see the diversity of our programs that are operating at a global scale uh, with our teams all around the world and see how that kind of intersects with work that's happening uh, in the policy education policy landscape with our colleagues at the Global Partnership for Education. So I'll give a few words of introduction, introducing kind of the, the, the big scope of the program. Uh, then I'll turn it over to, to Sarah Beardmore from the Global Partnership of Education to speak about their Climate Smart Schools framework. Then we'll hear a little bit from uh, the, the team. And then we'll kind of open up the floor for some moderated discussion or questions from the audience, depending on uh, how people are feeling in a few moments. So uh, it's really an opportunity, a very informal opportunity for everyone to kind of get to know the work that we're doing, get familiar with us, and see how we might be able to collaborate and work together moving forward here in this COP toward Earth Day 2023, and then of course toward COP 28 next year in Dubai. So. Uh, the Global Education Program at EarthDay.org. We are doing a number of different activities, uh, but we like to think of them in uh, different buckets or categories to help kind of streamline uh, the action areas of work that we're doing, right? So uh, first and foremost, we are working in service of teachers, schools, educators, uh, and providing them with resources and content and curriculum uh, that we create on their behalf that they can hopefully use inside of whatever education setting uh, they're working in, right? So we're not uh, working only with schools, but also with community centers and faith-based organizations and libraries and households and, and you name it. So uh, we really need to kind of reach a broad audience and bring them into our movement. So part of what we're doing is creating materials for them to use and then also kind of collecting and curating resources from peer organizations and kind of amplifying their good work and getting it out into uh, the public space as well. So in addition to kind of this content and curriculum piece, we're also doing uh, policy and advocacy work. So the best example of that recently is the Transforming Education Summit. So it kind of kicked off in June in Paris, and then it led to this event just before the UN General Assembly in September. And what we tried to do there is almost the opposite of what we're doing here at COP, but we tried to push the issue of climate change into the education agenda, whereas here we're trying to take the education agenda and, and squeeze it into the, into the climate space. So uh, we feel pretty good about the work that we were able to do there, and we're looking forward to kind of building on that momentum here at COP and then moving forward into the next year. Uh, we're also thinking kind of uh, about different frameworks and research for our climate literacy campaign. So we kicked off our climate literacy campaign in 2020 with a petition. We currently have 6,000 individual signatures from 126 countries in addition to more than 250 million signatories representing 
labor, representing their civil society organizations across the spectrum of, of actors. Uh, we recently did a survey, launched a global survey with our colleagues at Take Action Global and Shift Insight in the United Kingdom. Uh, we surveyed more than 1,000 teachers to see how they were integrating education for climate action into their classrooms. The findings are not surprising, and the, the report will be coming out in the weeks, months to follow, but some of the top line uh, findings is that, you know, school, the school community recognizes classroom teachers as sort of the champions of this issue, right? So they're the ones that are pushing it uh, in the face of barriers that they face that probably are not likely to be described, but administrative barriers, resource barriers, time constraints uh, that educators, educators face in the classroom. The other issue that we found that educators were struggling with is the, is the terminology that we use around climate change education. So uh, different groups are using different kinds of language. For example, we have here the Climate Education Hub, but if you went around the corner, you might be here someone referring to it as ACE, or if you went around to another pavilion, they're talking about education for sustainable development. And for educators trying to kind of bring this into their schools and into their communities, it becomes a challenge to kind of navigate that, uh, that landscape. Uh, the other thing that we found is that teachers are really trying to raise the profile of this issue, similar to what the youth groups are doing and, and we're doing here in the pavilion within the school community. Uh, so we're looking forward to kind of digging into those results and talking more about it later. Uh, so with that, I'll kind of stop there uh, and I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, Ms. Sarah Beardmore, who's the Senior Partnership Specialist at the Global Partnership for Education. We're happy to kind of talk through some of the questions about our program in a moment, but I definitely want to give the floor uh, to my colleague to speak about their very, very important work. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Is this working? Like this? Like this, okay. <laughs> yeah, it is a very tricky angle to get right. Okay, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me um, to this event. I, and thank you for hosting this pavilion. It is absolutely critical that we have a space for us to talk about education within the COP environment. It is a completely underestimated force for climate action and we have yet to really see the political commitment to this issue that we need. So the more that we can network and connect through this space and, and others, I think the, the closer we will get to really tackling the crisis that we face. Um, I also wanted to share a story. Actually, Earth Day was what first introduced me to the climate crisis when I was in third grade. And I remember my class hosting a discussion with a book called 50 Things You Can Do to Save the Earth. And so really the power of what you all are doing is reaching in, you know, back down into my childhood and, and the decades of work that has gone into building this movement is, I think, really powerful. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Um, I also want to say I think the, the work that Earth Day is doing is really powerful because it's driving a mind shift. And I think, you know, the existential imperative that we face of decarbonization, it's vital, but it's not the end solution. We could have all of the engineering solutions, we could have technical solutions, we could do carbon capture, but unless we change fundamentally our relationship with the planet, we're gonna continue to live in an unjust world where resources and people are exploited beyond their capacity. So we really need to make sure that we are restoring our relationship with the Earth's life systems and restoring our place as a part of those systems. We are not separate from nature. We are not above or outside of those systems that really feed us and nourish us. Um, we literally drink from the rivers. We literally breathe the air that the trees give us. So that reciprocity is really at the heart of what we need to be talking about in the climate movement. Um, and ultimately, it's about living within planetary boundaries. 
you know, this reciprocity is what's needed to move us away from a kind of unilateral extraction and exploitation relationship into one that is really about care for one another. And it's rather than othering and objectifying and commodifying and monetizing, it's about understanding that we are interconnected, interdependent, and we cannot survive without the care for other life on the planet. So that's really what's going to drive the change we need. Um, not only a reduction in CO2, but the restoration of the natural world and climate justice for people and our kin in the plant and animal kingdoms. So I think one of the issues that I, I look at when I see education is that we can't reduce it to a science module in the curriculum. We can't reduce it to um, one online program that teachers can look at to learn about the issue. We have to be building a movement, and that's what Earth Day is all about. So I really um, am honored to be on the stage and to learn more about all of the work of Earth Day team around the world. Um, now, I work at the Global Partnership for Education, and we focus on making sure that every child has a quality education. And we're the biggest fund and partnership in the world for education for low-income countries. And so we're really on the front lines of working with ministries of education and with partners at the country level to try to ensure that there are key priorities for system transformation that are then led by national movements and governments and are supported with our funding and our expertise. So for us, we see climate as one of the biggest barriers to education. There is no way we are going to universalize quality education when systems continue to be destroyed by natural disasters, when livelihoods are wrecked, when children are hungry because drought has destroyed the food sources that they rely on. And we can invest in all of the quality education we want, and like we've seen in California, the wildfires will shut those schools down. So unless we tackle this issue, we at GPE know that we're not achieving our mission. For that reason, we've really redoubled our commitment to work on climate action, to make sure that what we're doing is really integrating climate considerations at the systems level. And we're at the very beginning of this journey, um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we're starting to think about the problem. I held a consultation uh, earlier in the year with um, members of ministries from around the world just to try to understand, like, what are the challenges that you're facing? Where are the needs? And where can my organization as a partnership with $4 billion and partners around the world, how can we help you? And what struck me was there were initiatives to turn schools into cyclone shelters, or there were initiatives to help train teachers around climate concepts. But nobody actually had a really comprehensive idea from start to finish across the system about where the entry points were for climate action. And so these isolated efforts don't add up. And so we started to take a, a look at all of the different components of a system to try to understand what do we actually need across all of these areas and have an integrated solution because they're all interdependent. So starting with policy and planning, Every country needs to have a climate action plan for their education system, but also their ministries of environment need to ta factor in education as a part of the solution to what they're trying to do, whether it's ecosystem restoration or helping fuel the just transition. We need to see over the next year national adaptation plans and NDCs include education. It's critical that we start to have much stronger cross-sectoral coordination if we're really going to tackle this. The silos that we're in are not going to help us get anywhere. So really breaking down those silos is a part of the policy and planning imperative for the, for the climate agenda. We obviously can't do anything without partnerships and coordination. We need to be working with the climate movement. We need to be working with the education movement, the youth movement. But we also need all of the UN agencies to start talking to each other at global and at country level. We need to make sure that the climate funds are talking to the education funds, which brings me to finance. We need much more co-financing for this agenda. The nexus between education and climate is clear, and we need to be driving resources and delivering them together 
because both of these agendas need each other. And in fact, the most vulnerable people are hardest hit by climate, and they're suffering the highest rates of educational poverty. So we need to tackle those problems together. The physical infrastructure and facilities aspect looks at how we can make sure that schools are both safe. That means painting schools white so that heat doesn't bake children in the classroom. It means adding ventilation. It means adding wash facilities. It means placing schools outside of floodplains, building them in ways that communities can take safe harbor when they're there and ensuring that there's a plan for learning continuity when that happens. But it also means making sure that we're using schools as a whole education environment that's conducive to learning. There's so much opportunity for schools to have school gardens that help teach about native plants and drought resistant foods. We need to make sure that schools have rainwater harvesting and recycling facilities. The entire school environment can become a playground for children to learn in playful ways about what it is to take care of their environment and be in relationship to it. We also have the school and community linkages. And this one I find really compelling because education is actually the largest, most widespread public infrastructure across a country. There is literally a school touching nearly every community around the planet. So when we think about schools at the front lines of the climate emergency, they are the resource for communities to be able to gather, to mobilize, to learn, to share resources, to make sure that resilience skills are built. And without those linkages, we're really missing out on a completely untapped source of climate action. When we think about early warning systems, and we need to get the most rural, most vulnerable people the information they need to keep themselves safe, how are you gonna do that? Through the school system. And I don't think that the light bulb has gone off yet from our, our friends and colleagues working in disaster risk reduction about the amazing role that schools could play if we tapped into these networks of school communities. I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the curriculum teaching and learning because I think we all know that we not only need climate science-based class uh, skills, we actually need to change the way we think about pedagogy. We have been teaching children knowledge for what we thought was a certain future, and that's not gonna work anymore. We need to be teaching children to prepare them for a very uncertain world where instead of having banks of knowledge about different topics, we actually really need a pedagogy of doing, of problem solving, of adaptation, of, of creativity, imagination, entrepreneurship. Those are the skills that are really gonna help us build the future in a way that can, that can tackle the kind of risks we're facing that we, we just don't even know yet. And we need to change assessment because we can't have exams based on whether you've memorized the right facts. We need to have exams that test, are you learning? Are you, do you love to learn? Are you able to develop a project and see it through and see results and be curious? Um, are you able to work in teams? Are you able to show leadership? So we absolutely need to change our assessments because we, we teach what gets tested. And that's a fundamental challenge we still have to face. And then I think finally, data and evidence. What really strikes me is that there is a huge amount of data and it's not reaching schools and it's not reaching teachers and it's not reaching communities at the front lines. So we have all of this satellite imagery. We have amazing climate forecasting systems. That evidence and knowledge is not getting to the school to help them plan. But conversely, schools themselves have the potential to actually develop citizen scientists. They can go out into their local community. They can look at what the biodiversity stats are. They can try to learn about what's happening and report that back. And when crises hit, we also need to make sure that we have the data about wh who's been hurt, who's the most vulnerable, where are the schools closed, where have the textbooks washed away, so that we can have a much better response that really is meeting the needs of communities. So those data and evidence gaps are huge. So all of that to say, 
We can't make progress in any one of these areas unless we're thinking about all of them. And so at the Global Partnership for Education, we're working on this framework now to try to unpack each of these dimensions so that we can then turn around and have conversations with ministries of education around where the entry points might be in their particular context with their particular vulnerabilities to see what are the opportunities for us to strengthen the approach. Where can we really start to make a mind shift through the education policy sector from, from a systemic level, at scale? And where can we learn from innovations that are happening driven by organizations like Earth Day that could be taken up into the systems level and scaled to reach every school and every community and every extracurricular so that all learners have the same opportunities to really be a force for climate action. So we have a big task ahead of us. I'm going to stop there so that we can hear actually from the front lines about what is, what is happening on the ground. Uh, we have a lot to learn from Earth Day, and I'm really looking forward to hearing how you are working with the movement to really drive climate action. And I think together with a systems perspective, every stakeholder matters. We all have to align and coordinate. And so by taking a systems lens, we can see the value of all of the actors working in a way that's connected and that's interconnected and that can help us build a much stronger movement. And we don't have much time, so let's get to work. Matt, I'll turn it back. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, so we're going to jump into the next section. We'll be hearing from each of the members of the global education team. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that we, while we have one, two, three, four of us here on the stage, first, this is the first time that all of us have been together presently, uh, I think, ever. Or it's definitely the first time. I've been with Earth Day for one year, but this is the first time that we've all been present in that one year. I don't know if it's happened before, but... No, so the first time that we've all been together, so this is very exciting for us, just to be in the same place at the same time having a conversation. Uh, there are two members of our team who are missing. Uh, one colleague, uh, Rodolfo Beltran, who's in South America, and another colleague, Russell Al-Shahab, who's here, uh, but is not feeling well today, so he, he couldn't make it, so I'll say a couple words on his behalf in a few moments. Uh, but I'll just introduce our, our team very quickly. Uh, before we, we hear a video from Rodolfo in South America, we have Ms. Karuna Singh, who, is, who leads our India team. Uh, Mr. Gamid Abdul Basat, who is here from Tanzania. Derek Mugisha, who is here from Uganda. And Jean Pajan Mandu, who is here from Zimbabwe. So I hope I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about the work that you're doing uh, here in this forum and then, and then hearing. Uh, about how it intersects with the things that Sarah just discussed, and then also from audience members if they have questions or comments or, or want to kind of hear in more detail about the things that we are doing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our dear friend and colleague, Rodolfo Beltran, who, who is not here uh, presently, but he is probably somewhere on the internet watching this. So Rodolfo, thank you for joining us virtually. Greetings to all participants in COP27 Charm Earth Charm in Egypt. My name is Rodolfo Beltran. Uh, I am the regional director of Earth Day for South America and a very proud member of the global team of Earth Day in 192 countries of the world. In this opportunity with my team, uh, we are participating in uh, launching for the first time ever uh, our hub for climate education. I believe this is a very important step on this itinerary of a common cost that we have for climate change environment at these times. So you are very welcome to visit. It's going to be in these days, in, in the days of the, of the event of COP27. But it's going to be forever. After that, you know, it will be maintained with free access to all that value chain that, you know, are part and uh, composed of teachers, citizens, uh, students, uh, organizations, uh, native communities, 
trying to belong to all after, you know, the narration and the base here of COP27 will be a valuable tool and chain uh, for many schools and the educational system as well. So, and we share that also with all uh, similar uh, organizations like us that we have a common goal, a synergy for climate change education. Uh, in this COP27, uh, we have very important goals, you know, and which is to have always a, a permanent dialogue and a permanent inclusion in the agenda of the COP and future COPs on the insertion of climate uh, uh, and environmental education in the curriculum of the schools. Let's remind that in COP26 there was uh, a agreement, co-chairs agreement on this, on the, all the ministers uh, of environment and education, in which all the, the ministers of South America and the world participated. After that, there were important, you know, steps of not only the pre-COPs for the, the COP27, but also the test, you know, the Fund Education Summit that have to do with, with sustaining the development goals and the agenda of the 230, uh, you could say again that the United States action. So there has been considerable progress on this. This is a sequence. Uh, this is a, uh, a step this COP27 to include this, uh, uh, this subject. It's a very important subject because it's not only on education, it also deals with climate uh, justice, which is the step, a basic step for it social justice. Um, we are very grateful, really, for all in South America, all the governments, uh, national governments, uh, subnational governments, ministers, uh, municipal governments, and as well organizations similar to us, and also partners, honorary partners that we have, more than 200 honorary partners, and all the volunteers that are with them. So we really appreciate that. We have beautiful examples of advances in legislation, like the Argentina law on environment education school. Also, you know, the Rio de Janeiro City Council that approved recently that uh, environmental education should be in all schools. Those are just two examples in many, in many on all countries of Colombia, Peru, Argentina, Ecuador. All of them have done that progress. All of them, uh, Chile, uh, all of them have included in reconstitution the right to be educated and in the environment. But if also this has been uh, progressing to include uh, also ministers' uh, resolutions on that. One of the latest examples uh, that there is is that, as I mentioned, the city hall law, law in Rio de Janeiro, which is going to be an example. But there are other examples as well, you know, in Buenos Aires, you know, recently hosted the C40, um, the C40 uh, uh, summit of all majors of the world. And, you know, as they say, some, sometimes, see, sometimes I'm uh, faster than <laughs> governments. But it was a very, uh, country, very positive, uh, positive contribution for this goal. So our gratitude to them and also highlight the importance of directing this effort with examples, with actions. I want to just bring the, an example of two, two examples that I consider among others, which are all going to be uh, displayed in this, in, in this event, in, in our club. But two examples like the one of Julieta Martinez of Chile, a tremendous Chile, and Julio Vera Manzanares of Colombia. They started as children, as child, with the movement activists, you know, in protest, you know, for the environment. And now they are entrepreneurs, you know, not only written books, but they are leading schools, schools in, with their own resources for many countries of South America. So really, I congratulate people like this, um, movement like this, the municipal governments of Lima, the municipal governments of Rio, Rio de Janeiro, in that uh, Colombia, they all have in common one thing, you know, they have included educational programs now 
during the COVID started and is following up on education and on environment education. These are already national programs. I had the chance to, to listen to many of them. So I congratulate this. You know, the continuity is not only legislation, it's actions. If there are no actions, the legislation could be done, but will stay, you know, and sleep some time before being a reality. So this is the message of optimism and congratulations to all that come and come always with us with the Climate Education Hub and Climate Aid Education. We are citizens of the planet. Thank you very much. That is uh, Rodolfo, uh, who is a one-man uh, army in, in South America. So in, in addition to his video, he also shared this slide, and it will give you some idea of the amount of work that he's able to accomplish uh, similar to the rest of our uh, global teams as they kind of singularly or in small teams represent huge regions of the world working at local, regional, national, uh, and international scales. So very impressive work. Thank you, Rodolfo, for, for sharing that, that video. Uh, next, I'll pass the microphone. Uh, it's uh, Ms. Karuna Singh, who will share a little bit about uh, uh, what's happening in the India office as well as kind of more regionally in, in Asia. Good morning. Um, is that fine? Is no? Good morning. Yes, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I'm learning. Uh, so I'm from India and I look after the whole of Asia from there. In our country and in our region, we are focusing more on going beyond the written word. This is for two major reasons. One is that a lot of children do not have the opportunity for formal education. The second is that we don't want to focus on rote learning where you just learn the formulae or you learn some things and just spit them out for your exams and that's the end of it. We want to inspire students to do their bit for the environment. The other thing is that we did a study a couple of years back for the World Bank uh, to focus on why is it that although environmental education is mandated, as it is mandated in India, uh, we don't have that many environmental stewards coming out. So after running through 28 workshops in hamlets and villages and cities, uh, in urban uh, metro spaces, some of the findings included uh, what one of the teachers told us. She said, it's not important how we teach, but how they learn. So we have to have a shift of focus, not from what the teacher wants to teach, but to find a common way in which the student will learn. So my, my generation might do it with the written word, but I think teenagers today have a different way of learning through games, through taking responsibilities at a young age. So that's what we focused on. Of course, the main uh, focus of our uh, policy is to get governments to mandate climate education. Not many governments we found in our region have mandated it. Some have begun, like the Maldives, we were able to reach out to them and they began it. Of course, we did do it with Afghanistan, but that's a different story now. Uh, we don't know what's happening there. So we're working with other governments to get them to begin the process by mandating climate education. In India, we're working particularly with states, which do have their own policies, so that they can run programs in their own languages, in their own way, in a way that students are connected to it. Because if you talk about uh, global warming in the mountains of Kashmir and tell them that the oceans will rise, they're not going to understand that. And similarly, if we go to the state of Orissa, 
which is on the coast, and we tell them about the glaciers are going to melt, what do they care about that? But if we tell them that the oceans are going to rise and it's going to, your uh, fisher folk are not going to be able to get, uh, go out to fish, that has greater meaning for them. Coming down to educational institutions, we think it is important for them as well to go in for policy change and to set the examples. So later this month, we are coming out with an e-book of case studies of different academic institutions and the way they have stood up as examples for students to look at every day when they come to school or to come to university uh, and get inspired to do something for the environment. So some of the case studies are as simple as uh, there is an institution in Assam in a mining area where the students could not get education because they did, couldn't afford the fees. Uh, but instead, they were used for labor in the mines by their parents. And today, what the school has done is they make them pay their fees by bringing in discarded plastic. So the plastic is brought in. The children feel that they are paying for something. It's not a charity they're getting. And then they are trained to work with machines to recycle the plastic, to upcycle it into products, and earn money from it. So they no longer see uh, plastic as trash, but as cash. That is so very important. Or we have uh, an, uh, a technological uh, institution that has created a sound garden. Because humans, our ancestors, were in conversation with Earth. They listened to it, they looked at it, they smelt it. But today, with the cacophony of sounds that we have in urban spaces, with the garbage we see around, we are no longer in conversation with Earth. We've broken that link. So uh, these are the different, and they'll be on our website by the 24th of November, all for free to download and take. We think that it's important after administrative uh, institutions to go to teachers. Teachers are just given a task that this is what you have to teach, but they may not know how to make their lessons very interesting. And unfortunately, in India and other countries, it's the marks the student gets in the end that helps them get into some of the very prestigious universities. So we've had teacher training workshops right through COVID. We had uh, uh, online webinars with teachers. We've created a platform for them where they share how they teach, how does a history teacher teach that Mohenjo-daro, uh, the, the, uh, the people had to leave Mohenjo-daro because the monsoon shifted, how climate change affects you there, how the river changing its course has uh, led to so many a dynasty is dying out, and other things like that. So this has built a platform for teachers where they can share these uh, curriculum. We have regular um, you know, competitions for them to bring out the most effective way they have used to teach uh, their students. So of course, coming to students, we have taken a pledge to reach out to 10 million students in a decade, and we've already crossed that. So I'm glad to report that. We do it with a number of uh, activities. Uh, a lot of them that involve uh, their direct commitment using art forms. We have something called Earth Reel, where students have to go out and make uh, small two to three minute films. We've been running it for the last seven years. But the catch is that if you get uh, into the first 20, then your next set of marks will come from convincing the jury about your knowledge, about what you have filmed, what is its present status, what can you do to improve it as a student. So it's not just filming the beautiful wetlands, but you, know, you have to know what the wetlands are, are about. Or we use theater. In improvised schools, we have gone to uh, schools and told them where they don't have the use of the computer. A lot of urban 
uh, students can learn from things by going on the computer. But in improvised schools where they don't have that facility, we have asked them that when they walk to school to look at around the neighborhood and to pick one uh, item of concern, one environmental concern, then we take experts in theater, and then the students enact it. They enact it before peers, before their parents, at street corners, and we close the loop by connecting them to the municipal body. I don't know, I don't know what it does. So we are trying to see that we can also tap into the power of technology. What can technology, you know, be used to harness like education outcomes? So when they use the app, they are able to like tell, you know, what type of plant this is, and then what value, you know, can I get from it, for example? And then it also helps them to do the restoration efforts because when you know which areas are like, like need restoration, then you can go ahead and restore those kind of regions. Then the other one is we have put together a group of young people. Uh, thanks to Karuna for introducing such a program. Like she, like she said, she always gives other you know, people opportunities. We came up with My Future, My Voice program, which has like, mobilized uh, hundreds of youth to try and see how can we help them scale up their actions, for example, tell their stories, because most of them do amazing work in communities, but you know, few people don't even know about it. So we try to put this group of youth to always you know, engage, share best practices, share funding opportunities, for example, share like, you know, knowledge from what they're doing. But also, these youngsters have gone ahead uh, with our support, and we developed what we call the Africa Climate Ambassador Toolkit. So this toolkit is actually accessible on our website. If you go to earthday.org slash Africa, among uh, you know, the last bits of the website, you find all the templates we have developed with them. It's a very good tool because they're able to use this tool to go and educate. So when we came for COP, most of the things we did, like pushing out petitions, to ensure that our governments you know, make this mandatory, try to have plans, clear curriculums, but also provide funding for this. This wasn't possible for the past years. We have, like, we have tried to push this. So the students were like, no. And you know, the youth, this kind of coalition we have put together of amazing African youth, to see that this toolkit could be like an example to our leaders, our world leaders. Like, if you have like, clear curriculums. So ours is a user-friendly, so it's, it's easy accessible for even youngsters, you know, uni primarily kindergarten. They're able to, you know, utilize our toolkit. It's a very user-friendly toolkit. I would just love everyone to use it, download it, try to look through and also give us comments uh, if you are able to use it. Then the other one is we have mobilized a coalition of teachers uh, through the teacher union. So most of the teachers never knew that climate education could be a thing. So with our support, we have tried to ensure that, you know, together we can work together, you know, with the teachers and the ministry. Because the ministry say, you know, we are trying, we are coming up, you know, we are reviewing, but it takes long. But with the teacher voice, maybe this could be one way to accelerate the efforts. So because the teachers are the ones who are going to be educating this, but they also needed capacity. So we try to ensure that teachers have the exact capacity they need to, be, to pass on the right information. So that's another thing we are doing with the teacher groups. But also we are trying to see that uh, we push for financing for climate literacy and environmental education because it's very, very hard. Like commitments are not coming through that we thought, we thought. Because my thinking is education would have been achieved at COP1. This is 27 years down the road. And we're still saying, can you please educate? Can you try to put education mechanisms? Because the foundation is actually education first. So, so many Africans are left behind. Uh, and this is what we are trying to cope up with to see how can we be on the same level to implement, for example, have capacity, have skills. So. Another exciting program we do is we have an innovation kind of week where most of the things you have done throughout there are also showcased. So we do like an, a mini exhibition and most of the things we put there are like innovations. So from education, most people design innovations and then these innovations are cast during the, the week-long exhibition. So we attract private sector to see where they can invest so that we can scale up these kind of innovations. So I think I'll stop there, but another thing we have tried to push is the Vote Earth, uh, where you know, youth and young leaders try to and, you know, and push for leaders that talk about issues like education, for example, uh, and, and single-use plastics. So Vote Earth is a, a thing there. So from our work, we also inspired youth to go ahead and contest in national elections. So when they're empowered, you know, they have the information, they say, maybe we need to get to like 
Congress, for example, Parliament, and try to enact these kind of things. So that's what we are pushing for, education that has a civic component. Well, like we can get you through the rooms, but also get things done. So thank you very much. And we'll, we'll pass the mic uh, to Jean Petran Mandou, uh, who's here from Zimbabwe. Um, thank you so much, Matt. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so my colleagues from Africa have said most of the work that we do, but I would like to pick it up from where Derek just left it, the component of civic education. Um, from the work that we do in Zimbabwe and some African countries, we have tried to put up best practices that people can learn from because there's so many ways of communicating and capacitating or educating other people. So how can you get people to understand and believe um, the things that you are talking about? For instance, if I can just say it's raining outside, you know, with, you know, with the showers that we are hearing, would you believe that it's raining? Um, if you see raining, then, then you would see that it's, it's raining for sure. And, but some would believe it's raining without even seeing it. So the component of having it last and sticking is putting up some best practices. For instance, we have set up litter transfer centers, but after a bold and in-depth consultation of the problem within the area, the area or the environment that there is existing, so you will notice that with the allocations or geographical you know, differences that we have, um, I would give that example again of the waste transfer centers. People face different um, environmental challenges and problems, and with that, by that alone, we are being more responsive rather than you know um, re solving or trying to avoid the situation in the first place because we are already existing in a climate that is changing with environmental challenges. So we ideate together, we come up with a solution, we see how best we can set up an implementation plan. So we are both learning and having, you know, um, and contribution that is coming from both parts. Obviously, the uh, contribution from us coming with the experts who will facilitate the implementation and them also giving us what works for them. So you would see that the knowledge that they acquire gets to last even further. We have done the same by setting up fish, fish farming. Um, we have some lakes that we have that, you know, have been experiencing overfishing, pollution, a lot of things, and you know their catch has actually deteriorated their wild catch. So how best can we avoid that, or how can we add value, or capacitate them to do more? So with that alone, um, we have engaged in fish farming, putting up some natural fish ponds and the tributaries that can also restock the lake when it rains. You know the lake, um, the fish will migrate, getting back into the lake. When it's also getting lower, the fish come up and they are stocked and they. And then they have a sustainable cycle that they can do throughout the year. Um, we have done challenges with ecotourism, whereby you know everybody, most people are into sports. So with the landscapes that we have, some are mountains, some you know they are very nice terrains that we have. So we have set up um, some trails, encourage people to do sports like canoeing, marathon, um, bicycle, horse riding. And then they mobilize some resources that they can use for environmental projects within the area. So with having T-shirts, um, experience the nature and wildlife, the trees that are being cut, and how the views are like within the terrain, we are sort of like re-harmonizing people with nature again. So those are some of the, you know, the civic engagements that we are having and capacitating other people. Um, we have done some research with communities whereby you know, you can see some water bodies getting choked by hyacinth, water hyacinth, for instance, and other invasive species. Um, so how have we responded? We have managed to harvest, experiment together, because when you go and spend time and commit your time with the community on certain challenges and problems, then they will also, you know, appreciate you for that. They give you also your attention. So together, we would set a calendar, harvest the water hyacinth, Experiment it. We have experimented it for uh, organic uh, manure and fertilizers because um, they are said that water hyacinth absorbs and contains so many minerals or you know 
uh, absorb so much pollution from the water bodies also, even though it chokes out the oxygen. So for you to just put it directly on plants, even though it has, you know, um, it could be detrimental to people's health. So that was some of the things. So we had to, in to check that and also rope in some stakeholders like Emma, which have, um, you know, scientific capacity to do the tests, and the results came well negative and, you know, good for us to do that. So with the community, now they are doing it and using it for, um, you know, for their co as their compost and uh, as part of their manure. We did the same, you know, trying to combat it for briquetting, uh, mixing it with horse dung and manure. So these are some of the civic projects that we are doing um, with the community so that they get capacitated. Um, Moving on to some of the initiatives, we have gone around. That's how we are able to implement these civic initiatives. We have gone around uh, the country and amongst other countries that we have traveled to with, to engage with rural communities. So for instance, we have in Zimbabwe engaged with more than 15 or 20 um, to 20 rural communities, capacitating at least a group of 60 young people on climate and environment. So if you put together that number, you will notice that it's quite a huge number, and um, it's the small capacitation that you do that draws interest, because people are always fascinated by the things that they don't know, and it's always good that, you know, you observe, you obtain new knowledge, and you would feel quite happy to have new knowledge that you would share with your peer or your colleague, or even you know, better, because climate and environmental issues are something that are affecting us um, knowingly or, you know, unconsciously. So if it's bettering your yield, if it's bettering, you know, your lifestyle, if it's giving you better standards of living, then they are quite excited about it. So those are some of the conversations that we have. Um, they also have managed to contribute because amongst these capacity buildings, at times you have to conduct some consultations. Um, so you will notice that in the process of NDCs that we are being updated, you have to talk about policy with the communities, make sure that they understand what it is and they are involved in developing their policy and also contributing to their policy. So the entire process of staying with them, capacitating with them, and also them giving in a feedback that will also help them um, contribute to the, to the NDCs that are made were, were good. Uh, initiatives, and we actually had uh, a byproduct of policy briefs that have come up. Um, lastly, uh, I have so much to share, but of course I'll just try and keep it shortly. Um, we have been participating in policy. We are quite engaged with the governments um, in the Southern Africa. We have even engaged with UNESCO in their development of the ESD, the Education for Sustainable Development, and we are trying to ensure that climate component is well sound and outlined in there and governments are on board and prefer it more than too many other things. Um, so we have the political will. Now we're just heading towards the pathway and the funding that it needs to be implemented. Thank you for that. So, so thank you, everyone. Uh, that was just a, a, a really quick introduction to the work that we're doing. But as you can see, we are a small but incredibly mighty team uh, working uh, around around the world, right? So, uh, you know, sitting in our office in D.C., the thing that kind of pushes me forward is is the inspiration that I get from my colleagues who are, you know, on the ground at the front lines, working with kids and youth and teachers and parents and communities and government officials, uh, and to the extent that we can support their work. Uh, in any way we can, I'm happy that I have the opportunity to do that as a, as a, as a job. So uh, another round of applause, please, for uh, colleagues on the stage. Uh, with, with that, we have about 15 minutes left in our session. We have a, a, a nice audience here. We figure we would turn it over to you all if you have questions or actually even on the panel here. Like I said, this is the first time that we've ever been in the same place at the same time. If we have questions for one another that we don't get to a ask in, in, in the virtual space. Uh, thank you for all of the, um, 
all of the interventions, all of the um, stories today. Um, I'm speaking from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. We're the global voice of the library field. Um, and uh, for Sarah, I really note that um, the elements of community linkages and the call for cross-sectoral partnership and cooperation. Um, and I'd love to speak with you more about that. I think I, that's so central to our work. And we've seen the impact through these case studies, through these presentations. But I'd be really interested to hear more maybe from, from everyone in terms of um, turning these sorts of case studies into policy and support. Um, have you, and I, and I know we, we heard a bit about the, the need for um, evidence base, to build an evidence base, but I wonder um, from uh, the Global Partnership for Education and from your work uh, nationally, um, what strategies have you found to be successful in terms of interacting with um, education ministers and valorizing the role of climate literacy and, and education and, and turning that into strategies that can help realize these um, perhaps specifically community linkages and cross-sectoral um, uh, cooperation. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over, but I just want to encourage our panelists uh, to try to keep your, your answers brief, you know, 30 seconds to one minute so we can also field one more question. So our uh, success has uh, come. Our success has come from the fact that if we show the ministers how profitable it would be for them to invest in education, how they would have a better workforce, they would be more competitive in the world global field. Uh, that has been what we has driven us to go to bigger, uh, you know, get a bigger policy statement. Yeah, I mean, I think just acknowledging that we are in a world where there are short-term political cycles and there is very short-term like economic quarterly reporting. And so with those kind of uh, pressures on people in government, I think those arguments around economic development and uh, the just transition are, are very compelling. Um, but I would say that, that one of the things is also that where there is political will, even to take a, a long distance view of, of why we really need to address this crisis for future generations, I think making the case that it's, it's possible, there's things that, that can be done, there is evidence about what works in teaching climate, in, in mobilizing communities to action. And so part of the, the challenge I think is strengthening that evidence base and then making sure that ministries have you know, a kind of easy access to that to the how to do this, because otherwise the problem seems really insurmountable. Um, so making it possible to do, I think, is is part of the challenge. Yeah, uh, I think just to add on uh, what what the colleagues have said is, uh, my country uh, just launched a campaign of one student, one tree. But again, as I said earlier, these things are event-based model. You can simply invite a minister because you're doing that campaign, you know, for tree planting. But again, I guess uh, on my perspective, it's have, having a, uh, a tangible cross-sectoral engagement, which actually can not only conduct a research, but actually conduct a program and create a program together with the minister. And the ministers, what they want, they want to see what's your action plan. But, uh, not so, but so to say, also the uh, source of finance to conduct such a program. So I think, I think even Matt, we discussed um, a sort of a needs assessment to see what really the students need and in terms of what do they know about the environment and what can we do and create a program on that. So maybe creating a program will need a uh, cross-sectoral uh, approach, but again with finances and, of course, the skills which are from ourselves. Thank you so much. Okay, um, mine is a question, but at like an addendum to her question. So understanding, working with government for me has been around how do you get to be with them? Now, government make deliberate efforts and government make systematic efforts in tailoring um, what happened uh, um, within a space or within a sector, right? So the education sector, how do you work with the ministries of education 
the permanent secretary and what have you. I think as young people, what we've been doing in Nigeria and uh, across the um, countries GP is working as a GP youth leader is, you know, trying to change the attitude, the behaviors of these people occupying the offices and then looking at the offices as the offices that can make policies that can change um, um, the way people think. Now, if you look at it, all the people that occupy the office are people that are from communities, right? Now, communities are what contributes to what we are trying to shape, what we are trying to change. Now, the people, the young people, the children, the women, and what have you. Now, these people form part of these people in the community. So whenever we come, we try to change the, the attitude of that particular minister to be looking at education as a way to do. More to say to just have like a political priority for him to have personal interest. Now, you see someone having a personal interest about education, and all you need to do is to give him the action plan or give him the, the, the roadmap on how he can achieve that. So you can work together to be thinking in a systematic way and a deliberate way. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Faye from China. I work for an organization called Wildbounds. And very similar with what you do in India, we also, and many of you, uh, we also work with schools um, trying to make the schools more sustainable, design curriculums for, for teaching, and also train the teachers um, how, to, how to teach the curriculum, uh, at the same time um, organizing experiential learning and work with students. And um, what we found, and we've been speaking with hundreds of school heads um, in China, and most of the answer we get is sustainability or climate change is very important, it's nice to have, but it's not on my priority. And that is the kind of like the largest obstacle for us, for the teachers and the students who are really engaging and uh, want to make a change. So do you have any suggestions on how to make the schools the climate smart schools and have the initiative to, to be part of it? So uh, I think, as uh, Gamit said, you have to give them an action plan. And you have to, in any negotiations, you have to show them how they will come out winners in that. So if you're going in for solar, if you're saying that you know we want to go for solar, work it out and show them how their finances will improve, their budgets will look better with that. So I think uh, we have to do our background work also. Otherwise, if you just go to administration, they're not going to do it. You have to convince them. And you have to have a good argument for doing that. Yeah, I would say as well that there's an increasing imperative of governments to strengthen resilience. So if you look in China and the, the drought, right, it's an unprecedented eco ecological and environmental crisis that's impacting students and learners and school communities. So I think having very strong arguments around the climate drivers of vulnerability at the school level, coupled with an action plan that says, here's how you can address those vulnerabilities and in turn help make sure that the school is part of the solution rather than contributing to you know, the increasing environmental crises that we face. So those arguments I think are powerful. I'll just add one thing. Uh, in the work that we did in the lead up to the Transforming Education Summit, it was all about getting the issue of climate change into the leader statements at the summit, right? So, uh, you know, the teachers pointed out in this global survey that it, it, some of the barriers were administrative, right? Because of these priorities, these competing priorities. But the case we're trying to make here is that it's not an issue of adding climate change education into the curriculum but rather embedding climate change, the issue of climate change across the curriculum so that it's interwoven into all of the disciplinary areas. So the argument is not how do we get climate change into the curriculum, but how do we make climate change the curriculum, right? So that you're learning about it across subject areas, that it's, it's kind of bound up into mathematics and civics and uh, 
language arts and, and whatever the other arts and subject area, physical education. So it, it's not about kind of adding it in, but but embedding it within within the system, right? And if and that I think is the value of summits and conventions like the COP is that you can get these statements and commitments from leaders that give the permission structure to administrators to allow them to kind of take the initiative and lead on in those ways. And, and without those things, then you're right. It is this kind of competing set of agendas as, as Gamit alluded to, right? Everybody's in the school kind of pushing for their, and all of them are very important issues, right? But if we're, we can't have a curriculum for everything, right? We need to figure out kind of what are the skills and mindsets that allow learners and teachers to educate across these very important issues, right? So how do we do, how, how do we go about communication and problem solving and innovation and entrepreneurship and design thinking and networking and storytelling, right? These are all the kind of core concepts among others right we we do need to have some some knowledge and skills right technical knowledge uh, that we need to kind of lay down in a curriculum but uh, it, it doesn't need to be this or that right it can be all of these things kind of embedded and nested inside of one another uh, I, I mean that's just my my two cents there there I'm sure there are other viewpoints out there I uh, let's see what time well Unfortunately, we, we can hang around for, for questions, but I do want to give uh, the last word uh, to Sarah, uh, who can kind of close out the session. Uh, but please stick around in the Climate Education Hub. If this is an issue that is relevant to you or you're interested, we do have a strong lineup of, of speakers who are going to be coming in and out of this space over the course of the next week and a half. So please come back and see us, and, and we'll be around to, and happy to answer any questions over the course of your of your time here in in Egypt. So with that, Sarah. Thanks. Thank thank you so much for giving me the uh, the last word. Um, I think one of the insights that I've had while being here at COP is the grindingly slow pace of change that is being negotiated and wordsmithed at a glacial pace. And so we need the grassroots movement to already be realizing the change we need now. That is urgent. And so I think all of the efforts here are absolutely critical. That bottom up, we're not going to wait for governments to make the commitments. We're going to make it happen now in our own local communities with the networks that we work with. That is absolutely fundamental to the change we need. At the same time, we've got to keep putting pressure on the politicians, on the decision makers, on these negotiations to make sure that they are having a much, uh, that they're integrating a vision of education as a pillar of climate action and that they're investing in that agenda. I think we have an unprecedented opportunity now. Last year, there was like one high level event on education and climate. This year, there were 16. And I think a number of organizations like the GPE, like UNESCO, like Dubai Cares are starting to see that this is the moment for action. And we've actually heard, I think two days ago, that the United Arab Emirates will have a, an entire day devoted to education at next year's COP. And we need to do everything we can between now and then to make sure that that's not just a day for talk shops, but that there are real negotiations, integrating education in a much more systemic, powerful, and financed way in the climate agenda. So let's get to work, and we'll see you in 12 months at COP28.